Be careful with that. That's heavy. Look who I'm talking to. Hey, friendly readers. Welcome back to Storytime. I, as always, am your ever-friendly host, Story J. Well, as you can see, we're still getting settled in here at the treetop stop. And as I was unpacking, I came across some of my old comic books. Some of these go way back to when I was a kid in the 20th century. Back in the days before the internet and the TikToks. Just three channels. Oh, good times. Five on a good day. Now back when I was a teacher at camp, I did this story based on the three little pigs that was actually inspired by the character of Spider-Ham. Of course, I can't use that character because, well. And that brings us to a classic word. I know what you're thinking. It's not homage, it's homage. I know, French, fancy. It's a way of paying tribute to characters that you're inspired by. So I am inspired to bring you this old but new favorite, a new fairly paired fable in honor and homage of some of my favorite comic book characters. And it's copyright free. So friendly readers, I give you the three little super pigs. The three little super pigs. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. Three little super pigs, to be exact. The older star Spangled brother, the middle and more practical pig, and the last and youngest web-slinging sibling, their little sister. And so it came time when their mother said that she was done paying their enormous phone bills and student loans, and so it was off into the world for them to find their futures and build their homes. Now the first little pig went by the name of Spiral Ham, otherwise known as Swine Stacy. Now Swine, or Swin as she was known with her friends, had a special talent for all things uh, spidery. And one thing spiders are known for is web spinning. Being known to spin a good web, Swin went right to work. And within minutes, there stood the most beautiful web that would even put Charlotte green with envy. And speaking of green, it wasn't long after that her home attracted visitors, and one of them was clearly on his way. For along came the biggest, meanest, baddest wolf of them all, the incredibly big, bad bark. Now the bark was known in the local woodland community for having a bad temper when things didn't go his way, and never one to ask politely. The incredible bark just yelled, Little pig, little pig, let bark in! But Swen just looked down, shook her head at his rudeness, and said, Not by the hair of my super-powered chin. This made Bark mad, so he huffed, <gasps> and he puffed, <gasps> and he... Well, that would be true in another story. But this is the Incredible Bark. And Incredible Barks don't blow houses down. They... Exactly, and so he did. Bark smashed and smashed and smashed her house in, leaving nothing left but one sad little super pig. Once Bark was gone, Swen wondered where she would go. I know what I'll do. I'll ask my brother if I can stay with him. And so Spiral Ham set off into the city to find the middle brother's home.
Now the middle brother was a little more practical, and he made his fortune in inventing all sorts of gadgets. He went by Iron Ham, but under the helmet, he was known as Tony Pork. So when Swen asked her brother Tony if she could please stay with him, her brother smiled and said, you asked politely, so yes, you may. Much jubilation was had by all. But not long after came that familiar sound of the angry stomping and clomping of the incredibly big bad Bark. Now Bark saw the size of this new house and the pigs playing happily inside. This made Bark even greener and meaner. Little pigs, little pigs, let Bark in! But Tony just looked down, shook his head at Bark's rudeness, and said, Not by the hair of my ironclad chin. So Bark huffed. And he puffed. And he smashed and smashed and smashed that house in. Leaving nothing left but two sad little super pigs. Once Bark was gone, they both wondered where they should go. I know what we'll do, said Ironham. We'll ask our brother if we can stay with him. Now the oldest brother, and I do mean older, loved anything and everything retro, and was much more old school. But most importantly, he always made sure to treat everyone, all people equally, and his name was Hampton Tamerica. So when his two siblings asked, can we please stay with you? Because they asked so politely, Hampton answered, yes, you may. Much jubilation was had by all. Now Hampton didn't just live in any house. Whether you could call it a shielded helicopter carrier, or at least an airborne ark, it was truly a home befitting a patriotic pig. But it was not long after that dreaded sound of an even angrier, incredibly big bad bark came stomping and clomping along. Now Bark saw the size of this new house and the pigs playing happily inside. This made Bark even angrier and meaner. Little pigs, little pigs, let Bark in! But Hampton just looked down, shook his head at Bark's rudeness, and said, Not by the hair of my patriotic chin. So Bark huffed. <laughs> and he puffed. <laughs> And he smashed and smashed and smashed. But the house was still there. This made Bark furious. And he became even more angry. So he stomped and stomped and stomped and stomped and stomped. But the house was still there. Bark sat and sulked. Bark huff, bark puff, bark stomp and smash. Why bark still no get in? Now, when you want something, is it nice to yell and scream and throw things to get what you want? No. So have you tried taking a breath, think, use your manners, and maybe try asking politely. Little pigs, little pigs, can bark please come in? And Hampton said, because you asked so politely, yes, you may. Because kindness is a superpower. That made Bark feel really good inside. So Bark wasn't so incredibly big and bad anymore because he wasn't so incredibly mad anymore. And now he could go back to being his regular self of Brute Banner. Now Brute was happy and never had to be angry without friends again because by being kinder, he had superpowers too. And if we all use a little more kindness, then maybe we too can all live happily ever after. It's not always easy when you're having a rough day, especially when you're really mad or sad about something. It's not always easy to control your feelings. Take a look at the incredible bark. When he felt he was really upset, he stopped, took a breath, thought about his feelings, thought about what he wanted, and use those superpowers, those manners, to ask politely. You find that the more you practice using those good manners, the more you won't have to practice them because you'll just be a good mannered person. It's a really good way to cool things off for your friends and take the temperature down. You'll find that when everybody's polite, 
everything goes a lot smoother. You might not always get what you want every time. Everybody has a rough day from time to time, even superheroes. You want to know how I know? This little story that I'm about to share with you right now that is aptly titled, Even Superheroes Have Bad Days. Even Superheroes Have Bad Days. Written by Shelley Becker and illustrated by Ida Caban. When superheroes don't get their way, when they're sad, when they're mad, when they have a bad day, they could use their superpowers to kick, punch, and pound. They could shriek, they could screech with an ear-piercing sound. They could crush wooden crates and bend metal gates. They could throw trucks and buses across several states. They could knock over buildings like towers of blocks and crumble the streets into rubble and rocks. They could use laser eyes to ignite forest fires or fling boomerangs to deflate the town's tires. But upset superheroes have all sorts of choices. Instead of destruction and loud, livid voices, they burn angry steam off with speed of light hiking or super extreme outside space mountain biking. They race to the rescue of people in need and delight in the joy of a super good deed. They hatch super plans to help banish world sadness, building fabulous theme parks for giggles and gladness. They chase wanted bad guys with supercharged zing, dragging hundreds to jail, while police dance and sing. They track down and tame super menacing beasts and transform pity parties to victory feasts. But displeased superheroes who don't feel serene could have super temptation to cause a bad scene. They could blast icy blizzards on hot afternoons or walloping twisters and monster typhoons. They could spin super webs, super far, super sticky, and tangle up towns with their silk, super icky. They could rotate the planet and mess up world time or sit back and relax while the world fills with crime. When superheroes don't get their way, when they're sad, when they're mad, when they've had a bad day, they could super rampage. They could, but they don't. Because real superheroes just wouldn't. They won't. Instead, they dig down to their super best part, the strong superpowers contained in their heart. And using their talents as true heroes should, they battle the urge to do harm, though they could. They acknowledge their sorrow, their anger, their pain, as they wait for their super emotions to wane. It's okay if they frown. It's okay if they sigh. It's even okay if they slump down and cry. But then they get up and get on with their day, saving the world in their most super way. Superheroes have actually been around for centuries, even millennia. I mean, if you count the figures of mythology. And not just Greek mythology like Hercules, Perseus, and Athena, but African mythology like Anansi, the original Spider-Man. Or Norse mythology with... Wherein dost thou desire thine vessels? One second. I'm sorry, do what now? Huh, <sighs> where do you want these boxes? Oh! Oh, second door to the right. Cool beans. Good kid. Also copyright free. You can learn a lot from comic books. For instance, did you know that comic books use alliteration to help readers remember the important characters? Think about it. Peter Parker, Lois Lane, Lex Luthor, all beginning with the same first letter. All examples of alliteration. Now another one. You know those words like splash, bam, kapow, wham? All of those are examples of onomatopoeia. I know, I know. I was going to make a joke about that word, but let's move on. Another one. Not many people know that the first American hero was Latinx. Ever hear of Zorro? Zorro, created in 1919 with Don Diego as a secret identity, was one of the first superheroes, even without superpowers. Unless you count charm and, again, really good manners. 
Others came later, like the Lone Ranger, who was actually based on Bass Reeves, and the Phantom, or the Shadow. But it wasn't until 1938 when Superman hit the comic book pages. And for a long time after that, mainstream comics looked a little... same. During all that time, there were superheroes of color in the background. And here to tell you all about this is... well, me. So here's a two-minute black superhero lesson for you. Everyone knows how big I am in the superheroes. And given the new modern day mythos is mostly a boys club that still has a long way to go in diversity, I, Story J, take it upon myself in showcasing the black superheroes that most of us haven't even heard of. Many may think that Black Panther was the first black superhero. Au contraire. Black Panther had a long line of guys in tights to follow up. The honor of being the first black superhero created by an African American artist falls to Lion Man. Created by Oren C. Evans for the All Negro Comics Incorporated, the first African-American owned and operated comic book publisher, Evans published a single issue in June 1947 for a 15 cent omnibus. Wearing no mask, but only a loincloth and headband, a member of the Zulu tribe, Lion Man was an African-born college graduate and scientist sent by the United Nations to oversee a massive uranium deposit at the African Gold Coast, enough to construct an atomic bomb. Along the way, he takes in a young war orphan as a sidekick and defends the uranium crater known as the Magic Mountain against the likes of Dr. Blur Sangro. Now that Lion Man is public domain, other artists have thrown their hat in the ring for their own designs. And I have to admit, even I had to throw in my fedora for a stab at it. I'm Story J, and that's your two minute black superhero history lesson. I can't tell you how excited this made me when I was a kid. This is an actual imprint from a 1993 comic for Milestone Comics. Some of the most popular superheroes of color were those of Milestone. What's important to note about Milestone Comics is that not only was it the first since the 1940s, but was one of a few American comic book publishers that was created by black artists. And who better to tell you all about that is none other than Milestone Comics creator, Dennis Cowan. A lot of comic books when I was a kid. There were no black superheroes. None of them look like me. You know, first of all, let's say this. You can't have enough black heroes or enough African American heroes or heroes of color. You cannot have enough. After my mom died, I met this kid, Derek, Derek Dingle. I did not know what a comic book was until Derek showed me it. And I was just done. From that moment, I just looked at them and I was just, I was just gone. I remember the day when Derek bought me a copy of Fantastic Four number 52. And I remember us reading it under the desk. We were supposed to be, you know, doing our lessons. And that was the first time I had seen Black Panther. His introduction was him taking on the Fantastic Four to see if he could beat them. And he did. And as a kid, that blew my mind. The first African-American hero I saw was Luke Cage. I would go to my local comic book store. They had their comic book store spinner rack. And I remember this one standing out. It was just a single figure of a black man bursting out of chains. And I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Eventually, it became about us making our own comic books. I don't even think we thought to copy them or mimeograph them or anything. We just sold the original art, like stapled together, like, you know, you can get your own comic. Jim Shooter at uh, Marvel hired me to draw Blue Cage. Dwayne McDuffie was probably the only black writer that I had met. I met him because they had asked me to do Deathlock at Marvel, and he happened to be the writer. I responded to his writing immediately. And we both gotten to the point where we were frustrated at the lack of characters to express the things that we wanted to express. The how books today, they reflect the people who create them. At the time I said, if I want a world where there's black superheroes, we're gonna have to create some black superheroes. I told him, the only way we're going to see it is if we do it. Milestone was founded in, uh, actually it was founded in the 90s um, by myself uh, with, with uh, Derek Dingle, Michael Davis, and, and Dwayne McDuffie. The late, great Ray McDuffie. Milestone Comics was heroes for everybody. The political act was forming the company and having four black guys in charge. 
People of color are underrepresented in this industry, especially, I mean, in the entertainment industry in general, but especially in comic books. So uh, we all got together with the idea of doing comic books for creators of color. Uh, the best way to do that was to get together and to create a line of books that would reflect and represent our culture. So what I hope people get out of it is a well-rounded look at not only superheroes, but of our society and of our world and, and the world that we live in. By being very specific to what we know, the Black experience or whatever experience, the gay experience, whatever experience we're bringing to it, those specificities will speak to the universal truths. Another history maker is an author I'm about to introduce you to right now. Friendly readers, please help me welcome Mia Torreira. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi. and thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Mia. So uh, tell us a little about yourself for our young audiences and how you got into doing what you're doing. Okay, so I am a children's comic book author and I grew up obsessed with comics in all shapes, sizes, formats, whatever country of origin. If it was a comic, I would read it. And I wanted to eventually start writing them on my own. But when I got older and started having kids, I realized that a lot of the comics that I enjoyed growing up weren't really kid appropriate. And I wanted to write something that I thought children could read, parents could read it to their kids, and no one would feel awkward or feel like any of the subject matter was inappropriate. So I wanted to write child-friendly comic books and write stories that would introduce kids to comics in a safe and wholesome way. Tell us a little about the family known as the ISA, a.k.a. the, um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing them all right, the Amazing Amazia, mm -hmm. uh, the Incredible Eye, yeah. and Starboy. Tell us a little Starboy, bit about them. Starboy, yes. So they are preschoolers. They are a team of huh? superhero preschoolers. Um, the oldest would be the Incredible Eye, and the Incredible Eye is about aged five or so in, in the stories. So just about getting ready for kindergarten and as the oldest he feels you know like he's the boss he's the responsible one and he knows what to do even though he's only five mm -hmm. and the incredible eyes little brother is Starboy, and the amazing amazia is his cousin so they are a family of superheroes um but two of them are brothers and one is their cousin and they form a terrific trio as i like to call them amazing. and they are worldwide but currently based in the u.s and they are African. So they are the children of African immigrants and awesome. they as children of immigrants understand what it feels like to maybe sometimes feel a little out of place, um, but it's their job to make sure that children everywhere feel comfortable in their own skin and do what kids love best, which is having fun. What you don't see a lot of in comic books, especially when they do families, you don't see a lot of cousins. You'll see brother, sister, you know, fantastic <laughs> You're right. four black communities that the cousins mm -hmm. are very important. Cousins are basically your brother. Yeah, exactly. I did a little research. I know that there's some importance in the characters' names. It was important for me to choose names that are real, that have a connection to an actual African language being Yoruba, which is a language that I speak. Because I noticed that when I would read comics written, you know, by American writers and they would have an African character and they would make up a name. So, yeah. so Starboy's actual name is Irawa and Irawa means star, um, hence Starboy. And um, the Incredible Eye, his real name starts with the letter I and it's uh, Ileri. Ileri is promise and Ileri is, is promised in Yoruba, Irawa is, is star in, in Yoruba. Amazia is actually a Hebrew name, it's a biblical name. For oh. some reason, for a long time, I thought it was an African name because I knew a lot of kids growing up who, who had that name. And I have a nephew who has that name as well. But the way his parents would pronounce it, I was convinced it was African until I realized, no, it's actually biblical. And I think it means he who has the strength of the Lord. So these are names that have very strong, deep meanings. Um, and reflect in their heroics and in their heroic characters. If we were to look at maybe the original folk tales that come from West African countries and South African countries or East African countries, the heroes 
aren't muscle bound or no. in tight spandex. Uh, they're they're crafty. They're witty. Um, they they fight gods or they fight monsters. And once I started realizing that, I thought, okay, I want to write a story about preschool superheroes, but I don't want it to be what we've seen so far. So it's not going to be potty humor, and it's not going to be violent. How about that? Let me do something a little radical and not make it violent. Let's have the kids have powers, but use them in a way that's not violent. Because sometimes we just miniaturize superheroes and put them in kid bodies and have them doing the same kind of thing. So I'm going to punch this guy out and then I win. But what if as a child superhero, you have starlight power, like Starboy, for example, but instead of using it to harm the person who you're trying to stop, you simply use it to maybe if they've stolen a bunch of I shouldn't give away the plot, but if they've stolen uh, a bunch of cookies, maybe you can use your starlight to seal up maybe the cookie factory uh, at risk of giving away the story. But I was trying to be deliberate in, in writing this and make it really, really, truly for kids. But I've really enjoyed it. And so far, the, the feedback has been great from the different kid readers we've had. And when we launched on Amazon, and and the response just blew me away. I couldn't believe that it did so well. <laughs> There's a need for it. There's a need yeah. for representation. There's a mm -hmm. need for what you're doing right now. So that's all. That's fantastic. Uh, one last question, and this is just for you. Who was your favorite superhero growing up? Asterix. Oh, I remember. <laughs> Asterix. Yes. Asterix is a Franco-Belgian comic, probably more uh, Belgian than Franco. But anyway. Um, and I think I enjoyed Asterix so much because uh, whenever my mother would travel, I, I grew up in Nigeria, she would bring back Asterix comics for me. She knew I was into comics. She'd bring back Archie and all kinds of stuff. But Asterix in particular really resonated with me because here's this little guy, again, yeah. not muscle bound, mm -hmm. okay, not the, not the stereotypical looking hero. And he is fighting colonizers. <laughs> Yes. And I could relate because I was living in a country that was, you know, just maybe 20, 30 years independent at the time um, and was still living under the shadow of the British. And here's Asterix sticking it to the to the Romans each time. And he's protecting his people. He's protecting their their way of life. And all he, all he has to do is go, 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 go. And the little magic potion goes down his throat and boom, he's just as strong. And he, he doesn't change in size. He's just internally now stronger and able yeah. to you know defeat them so asterix was my my superhero so not superman batman a little gall in france <laughs> named asterix well before i was into spider-man i was into i guess the american version of asterix which was popeye yeah so popeye was the spinach asterix was the the potion mm -hmm. if i remember it now okay remind me what did was it obelix who yeah was always strong like he didn't need the juice or when he because he it fell into it as a baby <laughs> that's, right. that's what it was yes and that's why it's so big that's what yeah. it was i forgot about that mm -hmm. it's been years since i've seen an asterisk comic yeah Man. yeah i've got the whole collection i'm introducing my kids to it uh little by little <laughs> You're a very good mom. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, although at, at times it does get a little feisty because I'm like, don't touch my comics. Okay, you can touch mm -hmm. these ones. But, you know, the collector's <laughs> items that you keep on the high shelf. Yeah. Do don't yes. touch mommy's comics. <laughs> no, I <don't> do it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mia. It was great talking to you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Have me back anytime. You better believe it. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please get her comic books, The Incredible Eye, The Amazing Amazia, and who am I forgetting? Oh, and Starboy. Starboy. <laughs> get those comic books, ladies and gentlemen. You won't regret it. Thank you so much, Mia, and have a great one. Thank you. That was fun. That was fun. Well, it's about that time, guys. I hope y'all had as much fun learning about superheroes as I did talking about it. And I really hope you continue being the superhero that you already are. So be that hero to someone. Be gentle. Be kind. Be patient. And be you. And I'll see you next time. <laughs> Bark, we talked about this, buddy. Remember what we learned? Use your words. Count to ten. One, two, three. I'll see you next time. Four.
YouTubers, if you like what you see, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to see more, just click on the button where you can donate and be a paying contributor, where you can see more things like read alouds, drawing tutorials, virtual field trips, cartoons, and more. See more at Story J Storytime, and I'll see you next time.